I'm going to talk about, uh, about Mongoid, about uh, some of the latest developments that have been going on, what we're doing to uh, keep pushing it forward. Um, my name is Bernard Schaefer. It's uh, BJ Schaefer on Twitter. I'm on GitHub. And uh, that's my blog, azoinapa.com. And uh, I work for HashRocket. Um, so we're going to be talking about, about Mongoid. And uh, in particular, I want to talk about how we've come to embrace Rails 3 and how Mongoid has all along really embraced Mongoid, uh, Mongo itself. Um, but first, I want to wish Mongoid a happy birthday. This is exactly one year ago today that Duran first pushed the first commit for uh, uh, Mongoid. And yeah. <laughs> and it's been growing like crazy. We've, got, we've had 88 contributors, 40 contributors in the last two months with 300 commits. That's the uh, impact graph for, uh, on GitHub. If you look at <coughs> another Mongo library, that's the impact graph. So there's a real community behind, <laughs> there's a real community behind Mongoid. We've got good documentation. We've got an active IRC channel have a mailing list, and uh, it's global now. We've got, uh, for all of the error messages and validation messages, we have all of these languages supported. It's really easy to uh, fork and add your own. We're always looking to, uh, to gather as many new languages and uh, people as possible. So that's kind of the, just a quick intro I just wanted to say. Um, so now we're going to talk about Rails 3. Um, we, uh, we really love. Rails 3, and we've been trying to embrace it as much as possible, get as much in there. First thing is uh, rail ties. You can start up a new Mongoid app. You rails new, give it your app name, dash m, pass it at mongoid.org, rails.rb. That gives you a lot of different things. It gives you the generators. You can create uh, a model just like you would with Active Record. You can pass it the field names and types. That will spit out this. Um, and then we've also taken on active model, because it's all sorts of things, validations, all the standard validations that you expect with Rails, serialization, JSON, XML, all that good stuff, mass assignment, adder protected, accessible, works just like it would with uh, active resource, but um, still agnostic. So. Running with Sinatra, all of our stuff that's Rails specific is in the Rail tie. It's only there if you need it. Sinatra Padrino has built in support for Mongoid. Um, and what's cool is that Mongoid lets you work with other ORMs because eventually, or oftentimes, you'll need to have some sort of SQL solution. You can use it with Data Mapper, you can use it with Active Record. It just works for uh, cross associations. All right, so that. That gets a little bit of the, the Rails 3 stuff out of the way. Um, we've been spending a lot of time recently on that. And, uh, but now I want to talk about MongoDB. And like to say that an ORM, or an ODM is what we call object document mapper, that it loves its database, I think seems like it doesn't need to be said, but it, but it still does need to be said. Uh, like we've embraced all of the core tenets of, um, of MongoDB. And for us, if there's something that you can do with Mongo that you can't do with Mongoid, then that's a bug. And you should file an issue and let us know. Um, because we want to support everything that Mongo supports. Um, so Mongoid is, is really built to support a lot of the core Mongo features. Fast in place updates, rich document based querying, replication and high availability. These are the, these are pulled just straight from the, the Mongo website. Some of the, the core tenets, I think, of how MongoDB is built and how you can best use it. And so I want to focus on, on these things, what we've done recently to, uh, to really support all these things that Mongo does. Here's in place updates. All right, so you've got a, a person and it embeds many addresses. So that's going to be stored on the actual person document. And then our address embeds many locations as well. So a you know, person might have, I don't know, summer home somewhere or something. 
and uh, locations might be city names. And so if you look at the person's attributes, you'll see you've got your person's attribute, it's ID. It has addresses, there's an array of hashes, which also have IDs, and then that's going to have an array of hashes of locations. We could go through and we could grab, grab the location, set it to Austin. Um, other Mongo libraries will push the full document graph when we go to do that update. So this is what it would turn into like in Mongo. We're going to call update and we're gonna to have to pass it the entire document graph in order to do this update. So Mongo does it the Mongo way, which is that when you call update on something that's nested, it's only going to push exactly what is nested. So here what it's doing is it's finding, the first part is saying, okay, we're gonna update the, the user, the ID one and the who has an address with an ID of two, and then we're going to push onto that this new value um, for our location, which is significantly more optimized, much better way to do it, and it's the way that Mongo suggests you do it. And this applies to almost everything in Mongoid. So all of the, uh, it tracks your dirty changes and only pushes the new things. It uses the same syntax to do that. It'll, it finds the best way to push it out to the database while pushing the least amount of data as possible across the wire. <coughs> Rich query language. You know, this is one of the, the big features that Mongo has over other document databases is that, say like Couch where you've got everything is MapReduce. Uh, Mongo doesn't take that point of view, they want to have a rich query language, but still built on top of a document database. And so Mongoid supports all of this as well. You can have you know, a standard where clause. Maybe you have an, an all, you can pass it multiple parameters like that. You say less than 24, greater than 18. You can run in queries. You can also efficiently query nested documents. So here we're gonna find the person who has any address or location that maps to Austin. Um, and then that carries over into the name scopes as well. So we get active, we, you know, this was the, kind of like the query that we ran before, where we said, you know, age is greater than something. So we'll wrap it up into a scope and call that over. So now we can say where the name matches a regular expression that's active and is over 40. Um, and this will turn into a very efficient Mongo query. Um, and you can even do more filtering on top of that. Geospatial indexes. This is something that was added to Mongo in 1.4, which is just a few months ago. And um, it's another place where Mongo really tries to emphasize that you should be able to query whatever you want. And so here's how you would do it with Mongoid. We have our spot. I'm using terminology from Gowalla. Uh, we have a spot. We put something like a lat long field that's an array. It's going to be, you know, two numbers, and we're going to create a geo 2D index. Mongo doesn't have 3D geo indexing yet, but it's in the works. And if you're interested in that, then you should upvote the uh, ticket. So we can create our spot. Old Town Ale House, this is my favorite bar in Chicago. Those are the, uh, the coordinates for it. And so now what can we do with this? Oh, well, we can try to find other things that are nearby. So again, we could use the, uh, the same rich query syntax that Mongoid gives us to say, oh, we want all the spots where the lat long is near that. And so that's, um, with Mongo, it's gonna turn into almost exactly the same query and um, that will sort all of the results by the distance that they are from the current location. So you would want to add some sort of a limit at the end of that. We can also do something a little bit more complex. We can find, we can do a radius search. So here we're gonna try and find all of the places that are you know, within 0 0.01 and I'm not exactly sure what the radius corresponds to. You have to tweak it uh, to figure out. But so we're gonna find all the things that are nearby in this circular radius, you can also do box radiuses, radii, um, and uh, except for ourselves. But um, 
That looks pretty ugly, I think, at least. So we can, again, use the scopes that, uh, that Mongoid exposes here to create a very nice API on top of the existing supported features. So we'll write the same query that we did before. We'll wrap it up in a scope, scope and now we can find all the spots near the alehouse with a certain limit. All right, so replication and high availability. This is, again, NoSQL databases. This is what most of them are built for, and this is one of the core features of Mongo. But I think to first I want to talk about how it worked in 1.4 before I talk about how it now works in 1.6, which came out just a couple of weeks ago. 1.4, your replication option was master-slave. You got one big master and some number of slaves. You start it like this, you'd say, MongoD master, here's where it is. Take the slave, point it at the master, some other slave, point that one at the master. And uh, the way that it works then internally is you'll go, you'll write something to the master. At some point, it will be synced to the slaves. There's no guarantee of when it would be pushed, but it's required for durability. So Mongo right now does not have single server durability, so you have to have at least two servers running. Um, and um, so we have to have at least one master and at least one slave. With uh, Mongoid, this is all we have to do. We just point it at master. We create, it's going to write to master. But we need the slaves, so why don't we use them? So Mongoid comes with the ability to specify the list of slaves that you have. And then you can run queries, you can run read queries against your slave. Um, so here, this enslave can be attached to almost anything that you do in Mongoid. Um, and it will, it has an internal counter and it will round robin between all of your slaves. Um, but the problem with this is that it doesn't give you enough control. Uh, there's no guarantees for syncing, no automatic failover. So in this case, if we create this user, it's gonna write to the master. Uh, then we connect to the slave we go to ask for the user, and it's not there. And at some point, maybe it's two seconds, maybe it's not, then we, we finally get it there, but no control over that. The other thing is, master goes down. And you can't see that, but I said kill pit of master. Um, in order to, to recover from this, we have to kill one of the slaves, bring that one back up as the master, and then try to figure out what went wrong with the master. So the solution to that then is replica sets in 1.6. Um, this is a significantly better way to do it. Um, and so now what we do is we start up MongoD with a REPL set. And uh, there's no, no inherent master or slave here when you first start it up. You'll then run a command to, um, to configure your replica set, and then you're off. And what's great is that it works the same way. So you can still point uh, Mongoid at your slaves, still have your reads come from there, but it gives you all of the control. Like guarantees for syncing. To Mongoid, you can say attach safely to almost anything. Here you can pass it an f-sync option, which will make sure that it writes to disk before it returns. You pass it w, stands for write, and that will ensure that it's written to two of your nodes before it returns. You also pass it a timeout to have it raise an error if it takes too long. And it can be done on anything. You can do it on the instance level, class level, destruction, updates, inserts, all that stuff. And then automatic failover. What's great is that all of this stuff is handled by the actual Ruby driver. We kill our Mongo process. We try to create, it doesn't work. Two seconds later, we try to create, and it works. And so what happened there is that when um, our server went down, the uh, Mongo Ruby driver says, oh, I got a connection failure. I'm going to try and find one of the other nodes available in the system, and I'm going to redirect writes to that. So after some number of seconds, Mongo will have the ability to promote one of the other servers to master, and then everything starts working again without having any uh, intervention. And uh, 
we've uh, implemented a lot of other things as well recently. Um, basically, uh, everything that was new in 1.6 is supported in Mongoid, and it was supported within like a week or two um, of the new release. And uh, like I said, if you can do it with Mongo, then you should be able to do it with Mongoid. And uh, so what's next for us really depends a lot on what happens in Mongo. Um, that's what really drives most of the features, other than all the things that we like to do for day-to-day for -day support. Um, we're going to have uh, the release candidate up end of next week. Uh, this weekend, we'll have beta 17 up, which will support RC2 of Rails. And um, we'll have some, a lot of fixes for associations. We've done a rewrite of the associations to make them significantly better and faster. Um, and then it's whatever happens in Mongo. Um, virtual collections for embedded documents. This is something that's uh, up on the JIRA. It would allow you to query for and insert directly into embedded documents without having to talk to the parent documents. Um, real date support. This is, uh, has long been a frustration for us using Mongoid. And uh, there hasn't been a great solution yet. Um, but it's supposed to be fixed in 1.7. Um, another feature that's up that people are talking about is capped arrays. Um, so this would work just like Mongo has capped collections, which allow you to specify a particular size and a sort order. And you can just throw all the data that you want at it. It never grows above the size that you want. And people are talking about doing the same thing to have for embedded documents. And that's how Mongoid versioning works. You just include that. And as you make changes, it inserts a copy of the document on itself. And uh, this would be a great use case, being able to do that. Um, yeah, I guess I went through that kind of quickly. But um, this is where uh, you can get the slides if you're interested, Mongoid site and uh, the Mongoid source. And hopefully, you guys have a bunch of questions. Anyone? Yes? How's your Ruby 1.9 support? Uh, fully supported. Yes, we, uh, we run the entire test suite against 187, REE 187, 191, 192, and we have run it against JRuby as well, and that's all good. Yes? I guess about a year ago when Um, so the question is about using uh, Mongo for relational sort of associations. Um, no, I mean I think it, it's all about the the different use cases that you that you envision, the way that you're modeling your documents. Certainly, embedding everything is a bad idea, and you know people from Mongo will tell you that, and that's what Dern will say too. Um, but if you have too many relational associations, then you begin to, you have to question whether Mongo is really the right choice. Um, because you can't have, um, there's no consistency between, um, there's no safety between making changes to separate collections. Um, there's no transactions between them. Each, uh, you have atomic updates for embedded documents, but not for the others. So if you find yourself using too many of them, then that's a good sign that you should probably be looking at using a relational database for at least some of those things. Any others? Yes. Yes, um, you can say, you can set in the config, there's a safety config option, I think. And you can just say safety equals whatever you want. So fsync1 or 
W2, any of those sorts of things, and uh, that will apply through your entire app. All right, well, I guess if that's it, then uh, come ask me any questions if you want, and uh, you should hop on, come contribute. We love uh, having new people working on it. Thanks.